Hey Triple Fivers, Andrew here. In this video, we're gonna go through my truck gun setup. Although this gun doesn't live in my truck, it actually lives in this bag that I keep on my person. And in this video, I'm gonna go through the pace scenario that would lead me to want to have a setup like this that includes a portable AR-15, a plate carrier setup, and an IFAC kit all in this little bag. And I'm going to go through a number of ideas that are going to be needing consideration before we get to this kit. So stay tuned. Before we can really answer the question about whether a truck gun is necessary, there are some prior considerations that I want to acknowledge that are strictly speaking outside of the conversation when we get to the question of the utility and application of a truck gun, which is the main objective that I have in this video. My priority is to engage with my audience, and in recent videos I've been asking for feedback, and this topic was the one that was chosen. Now, Interestingly, when I also shared thumbnails about this video that I was working on, I got some negative feedback. And I want to address this directly. So let there be no mistake in what I'm about to say. The only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. One of the reasons in having a firearm for conceal and carry is for a self-defense contingency. But having something beyond a conceal and carry weapon is oftentimes a bright or dividing line between those who think that the use of rifles or perhaps firearms beyond a simple pistol or a shotgun is this idea that these type of weapons should be reserved for law enforcement or for military. And a I would respond to this in two different ways. First of all, we've got this thing called the Second Amendment. And the Second Amendment makes it clear that citizens have a responsibility to help secure a free state. And it is the right of the people to have arms that are going to ensure the security of that state. Now, this means that we need to be ready for not only outside attacks and insurgencies that might directly threaten the state, but also the risks that exist within our infrastructure and the kind of support that we would need as being our own first responders. And so it's those dire emergency situations that I'm very interested. All this is to say that when I'm coming to this video, I'm not coming out of a place of fear mongering or insecurity. In fact, the opposite is true. Any of you need anything at all, too bad. Deal with your problems yourselves like adults. So I am coming to you from a point of genuinely desiring to promote what I think are natural rights and a deep mindset approach that is gonna enable you to be prepared and hopefully to bring more value to a seemingly superficial question like should you have a truck gun or not. Now one more prior consideration that I would propose is genuinely important is that you have your general security approach squared away in advance. Here's what I mean, are you living in a safe place? Are your circles generally people living above board? Are you securing your basic rights? such as to hold and possess firearms legally. So to be a little bit more kit specific in the point that I'm trying to make, do you have a general purpose rifle? Uh, do you have a home defense rifle? Do you have your home defense in general squared away? To me, those are things that you should be thinking about before we're even talking about truck guns per se. That being said, the basic idea of a truck gun is an understanding that there may be occasions where a sufficient disparity of force in certain scenarios where a concealed carry pistol is not an adequate or proportionate defense mechanism. This requires really building out an understanding of a meaningful force continuum. And so that's what I'm going to be working on today. In an emergency continuum, utilizing something like the PACE framework, we can ascertain when a truck gun might have some genuine utility. So let's talk about the PACE framework itself. Now, the PACE framework is a military doctrine derived primarily from comms doctrine, and it is effectively dealing with an expanding range of possibilities, starting with the most ordinary and proximate and expanding to the most remote and contingent possibilities. I think that the PACE doctrine is a very clear way to spell out how to deal with the problem of disparity of force. So this does get at the question of firearms ownership in a fundamental way. Of course, in ordinary circumstances, firearms aren't needed at all. But as soon as we enter into a situation of criminal activity or infrastructure breakdown, these weapons are not only necessary to keep the peace, but also necessary to ensure social safety. 
Since the start of the new year, Minneapolis has experienced a surge in winter crime. To go a little bit deeper, those of you studying geopolitics understand that we could easily find ourselves in a situation of fourth or fifth generation warfare, even in the modern West. And, moreover, there are many indicators that our infrastructure would not necessarily be sustained in critical ways in an emergency situation. As I write this, I actually have a family member who doesn't have power in their house, and they haven't had power for three or four days. Let's just pick a simple scenario that's related to having a truck gun. Let's say our objective is just to get home. Hey, hon, it's me. Yeah, I also got the alert. Thanks for letting me know. I uh, just wanted to let you know that I'm on my way home from work right now. Looks like the main road is close, so I'm going to have to take the back route. Okay, make sure the kids get in the house and make sure the doors are locked. I will let the boys know, too, that I'm heading home. The primary mode, of course, of achieving this objective is just business as usual. Even us Ford owners have a car that hopefully has been maintained and is reliable and is just in general squared away to do your ordinary things, get to work, run errands, etc., I should, for example, have a full tank of gas. I should be able to keep my phone charged. Uh, people should know where I am. Just kind of ordinary stuff. An alternative situation is one that we nevertheless run into quite a bit. This is the kind of thing that you probably have already experienced, right? You get a flat tire. What happens if your GPS isn't working or you drop your phone and it's broken? Having alternative means to get home and to do all those things that are necessary in order to get home is critical. It could be as simple as having a friend or a colleague that's going to be able to drive you home, or it might mean that you have the tools and alternative means of communication, such as something as simple as a landline, to communicate with people about your status and to get your vehicle up and running again. I think that probably for most people this is as far as planning is taken because there is an assumption about the stability of society which in general probably is precluding the possibility of crime or any type of infrastructure issues presenting themselves. So if we take a look at a contingency situation, we might be able to more clearly demonstrate why further planning beyond an alternative is necessary. I don't think that most people would consider getting trapped in a snowstorm or in a fire or being present to civil instability as a very likely or alternative possibility. And yet, these are all things that I've personally experienced in a direct way in my life at different points in my life. In these scenarios, I've needed to have a degree of skills and kit that go beyond having just my basic alternative backup plan. In these types of situations, my cell phone hasn't worked and I haven't had access to a landline. I've needed to use something like satellite communication. My regular in-my-wallet first aid kit hasn't cut mustard and I've needed a larger first aid kit. Also, the typical extra bottle of water or snacks that I have in my truck are not going to be adequate because I'm going to need to be able to procure food and water for myself for a longer period of time. This is the kind of stuff that easily happens in a snowstorm. I also typically am not wearing blankets around, but in a snowstorm situation and in a cold situation, which many people are experiencing as I'm making this video, having these contingencies squared away in your vehicle might be the thing that is going to ensure your survival. Now, many people would consider those situations as described as an emergency, and in a kind of conventional way, they certainly are an emergency. But the final level of pace planning is dealing with an emergency that is a direct threat to human life. Now, this is the sort of thing that, of course, you should be able to avoid, if at all possible, by meeting all of the prior pace conditions, by having the situational intelligence and awareness, the forethought, and the social network to avoid getting into a situation where your life is going to be threatened. But it's also ridiculous to think that you can control all of those factors. And so that's where we're getting into the emergency scenario that I'm conceiving of while we are in our truck trying to get home. Yep, I hear approximate gunfire. Uh, it seems like it's within a block. Uh, let the officers know that I'm in an orange hat and my truck is red uh, and that I will be staying near my vehicle. If you're in a situation where there's an active threat against your life, having a concealed carry weapon is really a minimum. Mindset considerations here are fundamental. In an emergency situation where there's a direct and imminent threat to your life or a loved one's life, you have this natural right 
to defend yourself with proportionate force. This is of course a justification for any type of weapons use and certainly for having a conceal and carry weapon. But we have a further problem right now which is that in society we have a much greater disparity of force being deployed by criminals or other type of insurgent fifth generation warfare type of enemies. And this is the sort of thing where having a conceal and carry pistol probably is going to be inadequate. In fact, this seems to me a critical point where having a more powerful weapon is going to be a proportionate mode of defense. That being said, of course, accepting that responsibility is accepting serious legal consequences and possibly major financial responsibilities about this type of preparation. Even in a without rule of law type of situation, acting ethically and legally would plainly be in anyone's best interest. What's most certainly likely is that the law and order is going to be reestablished and the justification for your actions are going to be uh, very important. They're going to need to be rock solid. So that really brings me to the mindset considerations about deploying a truck gun in general. First and foremost, I think it's important to just understand that your truck is not a safe. Vehicles aren't designed to be utilized as a means of firearm storage. Though there are products that you know allow a gun to be secured in a car or to the roof or the ceiling of your car, this seems to be grossly inadequate when you're considering the type of emergency scenarios that would come up where you would actually want to deploy that firearm. You're going to need to engage targets outside of your vehicle. So in a fundamental way, I think it's important to keep your kit on your person and to have everything that you would need in the event of an active assailant threatening you or your loved ones. This is where the mobility versus firepower question comes in to play. And I think that it's probably true that the greater firepower you can have, the better you're going to be able to deal with this type of situation. So in general, I'm not a big fan of just carrying a second pistol in a backpack or even a PCC. The type of scenario that I'm talking about, it's really going to be appropriate to have at least this type of medium cartridge to be able to engage in an assailant effectively. But I also think that it's critically necessary to have a protection multiplier, and that means at minimum probably having some kind of armored backpack that you could use, and there are of course things that you can directly insert into a messenger bag or a backpack. But to me what makes most sense, knowing that uh, often utilizing a backpack or a messenger bag as a type of shield is going to be very awkward. Having actual plates and a firearm specific first aid kit makes a lot of sense and it makes sense to have it all in one place and to be able to deploy it staged in a way that you're going to be able to easily access everything. So in an emergency scenario where you might imagine perhaps being at a music concert where there's an insurgent force or perhaps in a city where there's civil unrest a truck gun would be deployed when you're engaging in that active and imminent threat to you and your family. Now, those principles being established, that PACE doctrine being outlined, that really brings us to how we're going to build out our kit in this situation. So the bag itself is a Rothko bag, and I tried to pick the most discreet looking bag I can pick. I know that Vertex and a bunch of other companies make rifle backpacks, and those had their place as well, but I was going for something that looked like a cheap exercise bag, or maybe even something that you would carry groceries in. And that bag is not ideally fitted for bringing a rifle and plate carrier, but it is about the right length, and is enabling me to have the rifle, the plate carrier, the IFAC, and then a number of accessories that I'm about to show you. Now the rifle build itself. Okay, so this is a full arrow precision build. It is an upper and lower that are both pre-COVID, so all of the kind of arrow quality control concerns have not applied to me. In fact, I think the upper is from like 2012. It's quite old. It is a 10 and a half inch pistol. I've got a chemo flash hider on it that has been rock set and is set on there with Accu washers. And the Chemo flash hider does work with the can that I use. I don't think a suppressor really makes sense in the type of scenario that I'm talking about, so I'm not bringing in a suppressor to this. The rail itself is a Midwest drop-in quad rail. I've been really happy with this rail. It's this Gen 2 rail that has a two-piece handguard and QD sockets right in the rail, and of course it's made in the USA. been very happy with this rail. I have a Ferro Concept Slingster. And the light is just a Streamlight HLX rail light. It's uh, the single CR123 battery. It's fine. I do have a cloud defensive light that I might put in there uh, as a replacement if this light goes kaput. I'm using a Holosun 403R red dot. I really like this light because it has an incredibly long life. 
The rest of the upper is just as an aero precision bolt carrier. It's got a mil spec charging handle. It's got the lot tactical folder, which I think is the right folder to get. Don't get any of the cheaper versions. Get one that's actually made out of steel. And then we've got uh, a heavy buffer and got the SBA3 brace too. So this upper has been very reliable, no issues, recoil is very manageable, and I like the size as well. It makes it very packable, even with that longer flash hider on the front. As far as the lower goes, it's pretty mil-spec. I've tried to just keep it manageable uh, and using regular parts, so if I need to service it, it's no problem. And like I mentioned, I'm trying to keep this rifle fairly affordable so that in the event that uh, this rifle had to be, you know, acquired by law enforcement in an investigation or something, it's not like I'm losing my nicest rifle. So in the lower itself, it's an arrow precision lower. I've got ambidextrous safety on it. It's got a, a Geisley two-stage trigger. Uh, it's got BCM internals, and it has some Seekins precision controls on it. Uh, I've got the Megvold K2 Plus grip, and basically it runs pretty mil spec -y overall. So what you've got in the end is basically a short quad rail pistol that I've built completely by myself. This rifle and all of its parts were not uh, given to me by any sponsors. This is actually what I'd like to run. It's about as cheap and as affordable as I would like to have a rifle just to ensure that I'm running with uh, very solid quality parts. And so far this rifle has been extremely reliable. I've had this build for, oh, probably about a year now. This type of build also is very similar to my other rifles so that when I'm training with this, it's similar to how I'm training with my other rifles. And that is something that I think is really important. If we take a look at my IFAC kit that I keep in this bag, it's pretty standard stuff by North American Rescue. I've got a chest seal vent. I've got a tourniquet. I've got some extra ear pro compass, some snacks, a lighter. And then I have basically all the standard stuff that you would have in a range first aid kit. And I think that it's valuable to have that, to have things like trauma shears, etc. Just because in addition to all the medical first aid kits, which I think you should have like a survival first aid kit, a quick access first aid kit in your truck, that this is one that you could easily use uh, as an attachment to the plate carrier or to a belt the way that this is set up. I like being able to have a couple options here to possibly be able to attach this to my belt or if I need to attach it to Molly. Uh, probably the first thing and, and main thing that I will be expecting to grab in an emergency situation is just going to be this type of first aid. And the rest of this stuff uh, may or may not be necessary, but this is going to be on top so that I can get it first. The other key accessories that I have in the bag are just stuff like a battery bank, snacks, you know, poncho in the event of there being any rain, uh, having a mask again for inclement weather and also for discretion depending on the type of scenario that we're in. Having an extra pair of gloves and the mechanics gloves really have worked out well for me. Having a moleskin and pen for notes. Uh, some hot hands because here in the Midwest it often gets cold, especially if you're doing any kind of administrative handling. Your hands might need something to warm up quickly. Having that paracord and uh, basically just having like a water bottle and a couple other things just always readily available. One thing that I also have in this first aid kit are safari land costs and again that's just a situation where if there's a without rule of law situation I need to apprehend someone or I'm trying to neutralize the threat having those cuffs might be uh, a, a piece of the puzzle. I also have ear pro I've been using these walker silencers not really happy with these to be completely honest I think that the battery life is pretty poor about every two weeks I need to replace the batteries in these so I am going to be looking for some sort of active ear pro that has uh, better charging capabilities than those. Having glasses that are impact rated is also a given. I do have those in my truck in general, but having an extra set in here is also something that I have. The plate carrier that I'm using is by Defense Mechanisms, and it is the Missin Essential Plate Carrier. This is a pretty slick plate carrier. It has a 5.56 plate card on it that I'm carrying HESCO L210s on it, which are basically just set up to deal with any type of rounds up to an AK. Other things that I like about this plate carry is the integrated drag handle on the back, the rear molly panel, and in general the fact that it's very comfortable. It's got basically a mesh liner, it's called their 3D mesh liner that enhances comfort. I also like defense mechanisms because they're made right here in Minnesota and there's a ton of customization available so if I wanted to build out this plate carrier into something more complete I could certainly do that. 
Thomas Sowell once said that there's no solutions, only trade-offs. And so when you consider the PACE framework and how I've built out my kit, this isn't the slickest way to have a rifle. This isn't the necessarily the most powerful rifle that I could have. It isn't the uh, most complete first aid kit, and it is uh, limited in a number of ways. But for me, this is a way to increase my firepower and to be able to meet those discrepancy of force situations where I'm going to need to just go a little bit further into the continuum in an emergency situation. These are my shots at 50 yards, three different rounds. As you can see, that's where I need to be practicing. Guys, if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to leave me a thumbs up in the comments below. Of course, I'd love to hear your ideas behind how you're preparing for these contingent and emergency scenarios. I'd love to hear from you about something that you would recommend to see differently on this. Uh, what you might change, what you think is completely wrong. Please let me know in the comments below and I will be glad to hear from you. And if you're new to the channel here, please like this video. Please consider subscribing to Triple Five Gear so that you can see more content like this, as well as participate in all the other ways that I'm planning ahead on this channel to bring more firearms content to you. Thanks a lot.